Pastor and Tech and I uh, were talking in the board meeting about prayer. And uh, one of the things that came up, you know, Pastor's been talking a lot about prayer lately. And uh, we're actually going to talk about prayer tonight. And then uh, the, men, the one of the messages that was given, the message that, that uh, the pastor said there, uh, was actually pretty much exactly what we're talking about tonight. And I know he didn't know what I was talking about, because I didn't even know that I was preaching tonight until, you know, this afternoon. He said, you know what, I'm tired, you go ahead and do the thing. So I said, okay, cool, let's do that. So I know he didn't know what I was talking about. Uh, but we were talking about prayer, and one of the things that came up uh, in, in the meeting that we had there was he was talking about the way that, and I actually had him repeat himself because I didn't quite understand what he was saying, that sometimes we will pray about something and God will tell us something, or if I could if I could say it like he said it, you'd understand what I was saying a little bit easier, so I'm going to try and say this a little bit differently. We pray about what we want, and then God lets us do it. You know what I mean? Like, there'll be something that we want to do anyway, so we'll pray about it, and then when God gives us the okay, we say it as, ah, God is, God is you know, this is what God wants me to do, and it's, no, 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 God is, is giving you, <laughs> letting you go off and do what you already decided in your heart to do anyways. And one of the things that he brought up was actually, this came up in the Sunday school lesson this morning. Um, where he's talking about in the book of Numbers, um, there's this uh, prophet, I guess you could call him if you want to, whatever, uh, by the name of Balaam. And uh, this is actually something he does, you know. Uh, he doesn't even, he said, these guys come and say, look, we want you to curse this nation. And uh, so he's like, okay, all right, well, let me see what the Lord has to say about this. And before he even asks God, God comes to him and says, don't go. So he says, all right, well, that's settled, you know, that's end of that story. But uh, then they come, you know, more uh, more well-known people with more money, and they say, okay, how about this? How about you come now? And he says, okay, let me ask God again. You know, and obviously Balaam totally wanted to take all this money and get this, you know, this name for himself. And so God tells him, yes, oh, great, God gave me my yes. If you guys have ever seen that Arrested Development, they came out with season four, and uh, the uncle tell, is talking to the nephew, and he says, are we good? And the nephew's like, no, we're not good. No. And and, 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 and uh, he's saying about why you know he's upset with his uncle, and his uncle says, but are we good? And, and then the nephew says, what do you want me to say, Uncle Joe? You want me to say, yes, we're good? And he says, ah, there it is. There's my yes. <laughs> and uh, you know that's exactly what we do with God. We just kind of like, you know, uh, get him to say yes. <laughs> like, and then we're like, yes, we got our yes. We can now do that thing that we know God doesn't want us to do. And, uh, and uh, you know, but it's different because God told us yes, you know. And, uh, you know, so that's why, it's, and then the pastor explained how that's why he's always talking about how when we pray, the first thing that God changes is our hearts. Because if we don't pray with the right heart, we'll basically be praying for our kingdom to come. And, uh, well, that's that's not... That's not good. <laughs> so tonight we're talking about why won't God answer me? We're talking about prayer here. Why do I pray and I pray and I pray? And it seems like God never hears my prayer. He never answers me. He never listens to me. It just seems like it's a complete waste of time. Have you ever been in that kind of situation? Where you're real discouraged and don't worry, it's just Jesus calling. <laughs> uh, where, you're in that, where you're in a real discouraging situation and you, and you keep praying, you keep asking, and it just seems like he never answers you. Well, don't look at me like that. I know I'm not the only person who's ever felt like, you know, what's the deal with this nonsense, God? So, um, there are some reasons why God won't answer our prayers. We've looked at this. Uh, pastors talked about this. I've talked about this. I'm pretty sure Chuck's talked about it. Um, so, I'm not really going to spend a whole lot of time on these things. You know, first off is we don't ask. God won't answer prayers if we don't ask, <laughs> Right? If we don't pray to God requesting of him something, that's what prayer is. Prayer is a request. And if we don't make our request known to God, now, once again, God knows everything, right? But he told us to ask, right? So if we don't make that request, God's not going to answer that request. It says that in James 4. Uh, it says, you don't have because you don't ask. So if you're interested in that, it's James chapter 4, verse 2. Another reason, sometimes we ask for something that God doesn't want us to have. And so God says no. Or something that God has already decided he's not going to do. <laughs> you know? Um, so an example of that is in 1 John 5 14. And I'm actually going to turn to this one. Um, and I 
it says there. I hate how when you get to the end of the Bible, there's all these little books, and you turn like one page, and you skip like seven books. First uh, John 5.14 says, um, This is the confidence we have, heard, we have before him. Okay, so this is, this is the confidence that we have. Okay? If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Well, that's a very encouraging word. But sometimes we don't pray for things that are according to his will. Sometimes we pray things that are according to our will. Like, uh, I don't know uh, if you guys are real familiar with it, but the idea that, you know, um, if you want a bigger house, if you want a bigger car, if you want you know a better paying job, if you want more money, if you want God to condone the sins that you're living in, all you have to do is just ask him for it. He'll, you know, it's fine. Forget about all those things that he said in his Bible. Just don't worry, don't worry about that stuff. Uh, it's actually called the, the um, name and claim it, you know, and that's kind of pretty self-explanatory. Uh, you know, you name what you want and you claim it that it's yours already. And then God's just, I guess, in, in some commitment, he's he's bound to you. You kind of have to, he's kind of has to just throw you a bone, I guess, you know. And that's kind of the idea there. Um, and then another reason. So, okay, the first reason was sometimes we don't ask. Sometimes uh, the second reason, we ask for something God doesn't want us to have. But then there's, you know, some other reasons. For instance, uh, sometimes we stop asking Sometimes we just didn't persevere in the, in the, um, you know, in the prayer. We didn't persevere in seeking after God for it. You know, there are some things that are set in stone that that prayer will not change. It will happen. Okay, Jesus will come again. He will not abandon us. He will remember his people. He will save us. He will set things right. He will do that. Doesn't matter how hard you pray against it. It will happen. But then there's other things that won't happen, no matter how hard you pray. Um, you know, for instance, well, I don't think that um, I need to give too many examples on this, but, you know, when witches and stuff give curses on things and whatnot, you know, God's not, he doesn't have to answer those kinds of things. Um, but then there's some things that God will give us if we ask him, but if we don't ask him, he won't give us. You know, so there's that. Um, and so prayer is kind of the opposite of giving up, Okay. People, people sometimes say this, I pray, but sometimes I just don't really feel like I believe what I'm praying. You know what I mean? Sometimes I feel like I'm just praying and I'm just kind of talking to myself almost. And then they bring up that verse in James where it says, you know, if any of you asks of God, make sure that you ask of faith, in faith. Hey, okay, buddy. Uh, because if you don't ask in faith, it's so good to see him walking around. He was in the hospital in El Paso for forever. It's so good to see him, you know, out and playing and walking around and talking and stuff. Man, it's so, it's so good to see that. Man, I'm sorry to disrupt the service, but man, it's so good to see him walking around. I mean, we were all pretty worried about that little guy that, that he wasn't going to make it, and here he is. So, I mean, we were all real grateful about that. <laughs> hey, I mean, as long as, he's, as long as he's, you know, keeping that heart rate going, that's good. Um, so anyways, uh, and sometimes we think that we have to bring our prayers to God in such a way that we are just asked perfectly. You know, we ask for the perfect thing with the perfect heart, and then God will hear us. But... Really, all that's required with prayer is that you keep praying, because the opposite of prayer is giving up. If you look at Luke chapter 18, verse 1, it says, Now he told them a parable on the need for them to pray always and not give up. So then what would be the opposite of that? Not praying and giving up. So as long as you're praying, well, okay, we're, we're, on the right, we're in the right direction, right? Now what James is more talking about when he says, make sure that when you ask, you don't ask with doubt, He's more talking about the way that it's just pointless words. When you're praying, know that you're praying to God. You see what I mean? And, and how do we know the character of God? Well, we read this word and we kind of see his character, right? He's a loving God. He, he's faithful and all that stuff. We read that in his word, right? And so you kind of have to know, think that you're praying to God, right? I mean, you can't just pray to anyone. You know, pray to Zeus, for instance. That's not going to get you anywhere. You have to have an idea of who you're praying to. Um, and that's more of what he's talking about. He's not saying you have to pray with perfection. Okay? And I think sometimes it's kind of taken out of context there. Um, and then a fourth thing I wanted to mention is sometimes, you know, God won't answer our prayers because we are being disobedient or we're living in sin. An example of this is found in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. It says, Husbands, make sure that you're doing all this so that God will listen to your prayers. In other words... And you can read it for yourself in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Don't mistreat your wives, or God will not hear your prayer. So there's a good example of living in sin. When you get to treat your wife however you want to treat her, and then just expect for God to roll out whatever prayer you 
well, it doesn't work like that. You know, obviously it's a two-way street. You know, husband and wife are, are, are equals together. So obviously wives, you can't, you know, be, a, be destructive in your own marriage. I mean, that's shooting yourself in the foot anyways. But at the time that Paul was writing, women really didn't have that much say so anyway. So he really didn't argue that point because it really wasn't worth arguing. Nobody was doing it anyways. Um, and then in Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, he says, you know, about forgiving others. And, and you know, long story short, Jesus said, if we don't forgive other people, God's not going to forgive us. Long story short, you can read through Matthew yourself, but that's kind of a powerful statement there, you know. And so that gives us another another example of how when we pray to God, we actually have to do it without without clinging onto a sin. Now, this is the problem of me saying something like that. Some of us think, okay, so if I do all the right things, then God has to answer me. No, no, no. Um, <laughs> we can't earn an answer from God, and nothing you do will ever make God answer you. Okay, but. Doing some things ensures that he won't listen to you. Does that kind of make sense? It puts a definite block, a definite no. <laughs> and when you live in your sin and you live in disobedience towards God and you live doing these things, you know, um, asking for whatever you want without giving any consideration to God's will, not asking, you know, according to what God wants, all these things, well, then it's just you're ensuring that God's not going to answer. So uh, don't get confused there. I'm not saying that you have to, you know, earn the prayer, God answering your prayer. I'm not saying that at all. Um, so then that bring that just I wanted to get past that really, really quick because you know we've talked about that. You know the reasons why God won't answer our prayers. But tonight I want to look at the other people, the people who say, "But I have been faithful and praying year after year. I've been faithful and praying." Uh, I I did ask with a good heart. Um, I uh, I did ask for the right thing. I did ask for the right for for with good motives. I prayed the right thing at the right time with the right heart. Everything was right. God still has answered me. Okay, that's who I want to look at tonight. Um, and you know, God is, the Bible is full of examples of this happening. For instance, in the book of Job. Here's Job, this extremely righteous person, minding his own business. Okay, <laughs> He's not doing anything. He's not causing nobody no harm, right? And out of nowhere, everything goes bad. I mean... Everything goes bad. He's got his, his family, a bunch of his family dies except for his wife who's just telling him, hey, go and curse God and die. Thanks for the support, honey. And, uh, <laughs> and then, uh, you know, he's got all of his wealth taken away from him. He's in pain because he's got all kinds of blisters and nonsense on his body. Well, that doesn't sound, sound very fair to Job, does it? I mean, <laughs> here he is, minding his own business, seeking after God. He's even intervening on behalf of his children just in case. And... Uh, and it still doesn't go well for him. So, you know, that, and there, there's, your, there's your God answering your prayers for you, you know. And, and that's sometimes the attitude that we kind of have, you know. I didn't do anything wrong. Why isn't God listening to me? Why isn't he answering? And so then jo Job, the book, goes on and on about him just crying out to God, like, okay, what is the deal? Why was I even born? And why won't you just answer me? I mean, I, I've prayed. I, you know, I, I don't know of anything. Just tell me what I've done wrong so I can stop doing it or whatever. Just do something. But don't just do nothing. You know, and this whole book is him, him, you know, getting, well, it sounds very frustrated with God. And uh, this isn't the only time that happens. You see it all happen all throughout the Bible. You know, Moses, for instance, where he's living in Egypt, and uh, he gets frustrated that his, his people, the Israelites, are in slavery. So he's decided, okay, I'm not going to wait any longer. I'm just going to do something about it. And uh, as a result, he ends up running out of Egypt for the next 40 years. <laughs> you know, if, if examples after examples in the Bible of, of people... Righteous people who are who are praying and not seeing an answer for for their prayers, and that's really what I want to focus on. So, um, the first thing why God sometimes doesn't answer us when you know we're seeking after Him and asking for the, for things is God does things in His time, and we have to just be okay with the waiting. You know what I mean? We think that. You know, just because we asked and we've been asking faithfully for year after year, that somehow means that God's calendar is going to align itself with our calendar. But if we start in faith, should we finish by works? No, we really shouldn't, should we? So then, if we started in faith, let's persevere in that faith and know that in God's time, right? In God's time. We just have to know that about our kids. That are, you know, about lost loved ones. We have to know that about, you know, problems with our with our work, problems with this or that. We have to know 
that God has his own time schedule. And we just have to be okay with that. You know, Abraham, for instance, waited year after year for this child of promise that he never saw. Well, until he's up in his 90s and, and, and Sarah, his wife, saw like, yeah, that's not going to happen. I don't know if you've you know, seen in this area down here, but nothing's happening. And I, I don't know how you think people conceive, but Abraham, this is a joke. I can't conceive. You know, and so you just have these people who are just in hopeless situations. And God says, I didn't say it was hopeless. You said it was hopeless. So remember that God has his own time frame when he's doing things. Um, but the problem is we get tired of waiting and we do what God already told us not to do. See, God told us not to do something. We say, okay, God, I'll wait for you. I'll, I'll, you know, you, whatever you say, ooh, ooh, we, God, I'll just wait on you till the day I die. Well, then five years later, you're like, well, okay, I'm done. <laughs> well, it doesn't really work like that. You know? And so what happens is then we go and do something that we God told us not to do, but it's different now because it's later in life. Surely God has forgotten what he said five years ago because the situation has changed. That means I can go and do this thing that you told me not to do because it's different now. Um, no, 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 no. In 2 Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 8, um, he, he writes this. He says, Dear friends, don't overlook this one fact. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. Well, I don't know about you, but there's some things that I've been praying for that I hope doesn't take a thousand years. I sure hope that doesn't happen. I, have, have you ever prayed for loved ones to get saved? I mean, how terrible would that be, you know? I guess God would have to postpone their death for a thousand years until they get saved. You see what I mean? Like, uh, anyways. Um... And then another reason, so the first thing, God does things in his time. But then the second thing, God cares more than us, not less than us. You know, we don't have to convince God to care about something that we care about. See, a lot of our prayers, we think, are us coming to God and telling him, okay, God, this is, this is what, the, what the situation is, okay? I care about this, and so now you have to answer it. See, but the, it's the exact opposite. See, God cared about it before we knew to care about it. Do you understand what I just said? Basically, before you had kids, God knew that your kids would walk away from him. Whoa, mind blown, right? And then he knew that he was going to save them in the end anyways. So calm down with all that worrying nonsense and just let God be God, right? Just let, it, let God be God. Let him do his thing. You know, uh, when, you're, when you're working construction, you know, your boss expects you to go do that thing. Go do it. Get it done, right? Well, in Christianity, it's kind of the exact opposite. Your, your boss kind of wants you to wait and chill out while he does that thing. That's very, very hard for a lot of people because it, you know, I, it's like, well, surely God would use me to beat sense into this person, right? Surely God would use me to save my kids. Surely God would use me to bring a, bring a change in this situation. Well, then when God doesn't, well, we don't like that. That's a... Uh, that's the anti what we wanted. <laughs> so in Jeremiah 31, 3, it says, I have loved you with an everlasting love, therefore I have continued to extend faithful love to you. God loves, loves these people and these, uh, these things you're praying about. He cares more than you care, not less. You don't have to convince God to care. Next, so okay, God does things in his time. God cares more than us. And then a third thing, there's four things I want to mention, but a third thing, God understands completely, whereas we have limited knowledge. See? What that means is that means that God understands all the ifs, ands, or buts. He understands all the things that could happen, that will happen. See what I mean? He understands all those different possibilities. In fact, in the book of, uh, I think it's 1 Samuel. No, I, maybe it's 2nd Samuel. No? Well, I don't know. Either 1st or 2nd Samuel. It doesn't really matter. In the Hebrew Bible, it was the same thing anyway, so it really doesn't matter. Uh, but in either 1st or 2nd Samuel... Um, you know, God's, David's talking to God and he says, if I do this, are they going to do that? And God says, yeah, they're going to do that if you do that, so don't do that. And David says, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and leave the city then? And God says, yeah, leave the city. See, God told David something that would have happened, not something that did happen. See what I mean? God knows all possible outcomes and all actual outcomes. He exists outside of time. He's not bound by time. And see, that blows our minds because everything we've already seen is bound by time, right? You go to work, you work a miserable eight hours, and then you get pennies a couple weeks later. 
Well, that's how we kind of see our lives going. We gradually get older until finally we look at the mirror and we say, what happened to you? You are a gorgeous specter of humanity. You know, oh my gosh, you, I looked at you in your youth and boy, you were the cat's meow. Now you're an old wrinkly fart. What has happened to you? And, uh, you know, and then the guy in the mirror says, oh, are you talking to me? I speak up. I can't hear what you're saying. You know, and, and it's a lot different. It's a lot different than you thought it would go when you were a kid. And, uh, Anyways, in Isaiah chapter five, uh, 55, Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8, it says this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and your ways are not my ways. So, translation, God has a different way of looking at things and a different way of thinking about things. Okay, this is the Lord's declaration. For as heaven is higher than the earth... Okay, I want you to think about that. As heaven is higher than the earth. Has anybody ever found heaven? Yes, or any of them? No? So we're talking about a great distance here, aren't we? As heaven is higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And the idea here is that God's ways are so much better and more than ours that they're com it's completely incomprehensible for us to understand that. You know what I mean? There's always this like, oh... Okay, in the words of Job, man, I really spoke when I didn't know what I was saying. I put my hand over my mouth. I'm sorry, God, you, you were right. Uh, and my thoughts, then your thoughts. For just as rain and snow fall from heaven and do not return there without saturating the earth and making it germinate and sprout and providing seed to sow and food to eat, so my word that comes from my mouth will not return to me empty. This is God speaking. My word, which I have spoken, is not going to return to me empty. Well, that's a promise and a half, and you can think on that. But it will accomplish what I please. God will see it through. And it will prosper in what I send it to do. If there is any hope to be found, let it be that. That God is a, is a God of his word. So a few other things here. We've talked about God does things in his time. We've talked about God cares more than us. And we've talked about how God understands completely, whereas we just understand in a little part. And here's the fourth thing I really want to say here. Which, to me, I think is the most important for me because I think it speaks to me the most. I don't know if it's going to be the most important to you. But I put it at the end for that reason. I was like, man, this really makes me happy. And uh, sorry if you thought I should have gone earlier. Uh, God is answering. Why isn't God answering my prayer? He is. Why do you think that he's not answering it? Well, because it hasn't happened yet. Haven't you ever heard that all good things worth having take time? Right? Patience is a, is a virtue. You know, all these things that sometimes we forget about how just because it doesn't happen instantly doesn't mean it's not worth waiting for. Right? If Abraham gave up waiting, the entire nation of Israel wouldn't have been. See what I mean? And I'm not saying once again that God's will is dependent on our, on our will. I, Pastor talked about that this morning. I really don't want to get too off on that. I'm just saying... That when we stand in faith, we will reap the consequences, okay? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. And I really want you to, um, to hear this one, okay? If you have a pen, write, underline this in your Bible, okay? Now, faith is the reality of what is hoped for. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Did you hear what that verse just said? Faith is the reality of what is hoped for. Now, I know, you know, genius here, but I think I know what words mean. Hope is something that you expect, something that you look forward to happening. If it has already happened, it's not hope, it's a realization, a reality. Well, that's exactly what faith is. Faith is the reality of what is hoped for. Basically, it goes like this. God tells you something. And you cling on to it, and you know it is happening, regardless of whether in this point of time I see it happening. That is faith. That's a heck of a statement, isn't it? Faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. The proof of what is not seen. Now, here in America, you know, we kind of have this whole thing, you know, well, I can't eat my cake if I don't have my cake. But faith... It says the exact opposite. It says, yeah, go ahead and eat your cake because you may not see your cake, but it's there. You just wait. You hold on. The cake's there. Well, all right. 
And if you ever played a game called Portal, you know the cake is a lie. But in the, in, the, in the situation of faith, the cake is not a lie. It's there. You just got to wait and patiently endure until you get it. Okay? It it's, it's, sometimes seems like a waiting game, but trust me, in the end, it'll be a lot. It'll be worth the wait. And so I kind of want to end on, on this before we get to our conclusion. Faith must meet prayer and vice versa. If there's faith without prayer, you see what I mean? Some people say, oh, I have faith that this is going to happen, so I don't need to pray. God didn't give you that option. He said, pray. If you have faith that it's going to happen, all the greater. That means you can strengthen someone else who doesn't have faith. Good deal. But if you have prayer without faith, you're just mumbling to yourself. Okay? Faith, you have to know who you're talking to. Okay? Once again, you don't have to pray and complete, complete. You know, we try to make it a thing all about our faith, basically having faith in our faith. That my faith is so righteous that my faith can beat up your faith. You know, maybe behind the gym after school today, guys. Oh, my faith will beat up your faith. And that's not really how faith works, is it? But that's how we make it out to be. You know, if my faith is strong enough, then God's just going to have to answer me. Because my faith strong armed God. Well, yeah, there we go. What? So, uh, put your faith in God and meet that faith with prayer. So my, my conclusion is, is, is fairly simple. Faith is believing and trusting that God is who he said and that he will do what he said. Faith is believing and trusting that God is who he said and that he will do what he said. Right? Amen. So, stand firm and keep praying and don't, don't stop standing firm and don't stop praying. The Bible talks about that over and over again. Standing firm and praying. Okay? Don't grow bitter when other people give up. Sometimes God gives a dream and he gives a vision of what it what will be. Not of what is, but what will be. And so we pray and we seek and we see other people just kind of give up on the dream. And it, 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 it hurts us inside because somehow we feel like our faith is tied to that person's faith. And we feel like we've just been abandoned in the midst of a battle. But I want you to look at it a little bit different. I want you to look at it as God has strategically placed you knowing that you could be a light to that person. Look at it a little bit differently. Just because someone else gives up on the dream that God gave doesn't mean that you should too. See what I mean? You stand firm to that truth even when it doesn't make sense. Because when has faith ever made sense? When has it ever made sense? Yeah, God's going to come as a man and then die as a man, and then be resurrected, and then he's going to come again. What? Why would you do that? Why would you submit yourself to people who have scorned you? Man, if I was going to go and save somebody from death, they'd have to beg me on their on all fours. They'd have to get down and grovel. But God didn't do that. He came as a man, without his asking, and died on our behalf so that we could be saved. We didn't even know that we needed save, to be saved. That's quite a statement, because that's just how God works. So, don't grow bitter when others, when others give up, and stand firm and keep praying. Don't worry about who else has fallen, who else has given up. You stand firm, and you keep praying. Right? Because if you remember at the end of, end of the Gospel of John, Jesus says this thing to Peter, and he turns and points to John, and he says, what about him, though? What about John? What are you going to do with John? And Jesus says to Peter, what is that to you? If I keep him alive until I come again, what does that matter to you? Don't worry about what other people got going on. You seek the Lord. You stand firm and you pray. Right? So if you'll join me in prayer. Lord, sometimes in our pain, we want to pray something along the lines of this. Redeem me from this. Take away all pain and help me to live the rest of my life in comfort. But we know that sometimes that's not exactly your will. For instance, we know that when Jesus died on the cross, that that was very painful. And yet, it was your will. Lord, I pray that you would help us to stand in prayer, not in our will, but in your will. We pray that our chant, our longing, our, our mantra, if you will, our, our holding fast faith declaration would be, Lord, not my will, but yours. That in all these things, Lord, we would always 
always say, not my will, but in yours. Because we're not building up our kingdom, Lord, we're, we're building yours. Lord, help us not grow complacent in that. Help us to realize we've been charged with the task. And ours is not to give up. Ours is to stand firm in the faith that you are who you said you are. And that you will do what you said you will do. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen us and soften us through the pain of sorrow instead of allowing us to become hardened. Lord, that our hearts would be softened and we, that we would allow you to mold us and to work in us, Lord, even though the situations are painful. That we wouldn't be hardened. And Lord, I, I pray for the, for the food tonight. I pray that you bless it and help us to have a good time of fellowship.